Slater, one of our lead economists. And can I start by welcoming you all to this Oxford Economics webinar on our global forecast update and impacts of a stronger dollar on emerging markets. Just before we get started, a few housekeeping points. Myself, Marcus, will provide a 15-minute presentation before I invite my colleague Adam Slater for a discussion about the impacts of the stronger dollar on emerging markets. We'll then be taking questions from the audience. If you'd like to ask a question, uh, there should be a drop-down box at the top of your screen. Please use the chat icon that is the drop in the drop-down at the top of your screen and send a private message to the host, Adrian. This can be done throughout the presentation, so if you have questions during uh, our talk, don't wait until the Q&A to ask questions. Um, can I also please remind you to stay on mute so there is no disruption during the webinar. And that's all. With that, I'll kick off. So the agenda for today is uh, we'll start with a forecast overview. So we recently cut world GDP growth down to 2.7% this year, driven by downgrades to the U.S., China, and Brazil. Then we're going to compare our forecast with um, 3, 6, 9, and 12 months ago. Um, and then we're going to go through the links between subpar growth, low inflation, and the slow rate normalization in the advanced economies. Then we're going to touch the points on the divergence between the U.S. Fed, the ECB, and the Bank of Japan, and their implications for the exchange rates. Um, and then briefly, we're going to discuss a little bit about China, explaining um, the reasons for the downgrade, which is related to a fiscal squeeze at the lo local government level. And then I will build up the bridge uh, for Adam's presentation, which is about uh, emerging markets. So the recent wave in U.S. dollar strength will probably leave some emerging markets swimming naked. Then Adam will kick off talking about implications of a stronger dollar to the emerging markets. He will talk about the build-up in um, external debt in these countries. Um, who are the countries most vulnerable to it, and what are the channels uh, that make them more vulnerable. And then bringing it all together, he's going to present a bit of a risk matrix that he built up. So getting started with our global GDP, this table presents a preview of our, global, our GDP growth forecast uh, for the world and for some aggregates and some key countries. And below, you can find the difference in growth rates with respect to last <coughs> month. So this year, we forecast that the global upswing will be delayed by one year. So GDP growth will remain stable in the 2.7 we saw last year um, in 2015. Um, and the reasons for that is a downgrade to the outlook in the U.S., if you can look on the table on the, uh, on be <coughs> below you. So it's a 0.2 percentage points downgrade to the outlook in the U.S., 0.1 in, in Japan, and another 0.2 in China. Um, also, Brazil got downgraded by 0.2. So it will be another 3% miss for the U.S. So now the U.K. leads the pack in the advanced economies with the fastest growing advanced economy. In Japan, we have weak growth and in core inflation hedging back to zero. So it's likely that the Bank of Japan will put more QE um, later on this year. Um, the recession in Russia may not be as deep as feared, uh, but the medium term was revised down. And when we say not as deep as feared, it was revised up from minus six something to minus five something. So it's still pretty grim out there. And in Brazil, it's just business as usual, another downgrade to the outlook. So how do we compare with uh, three months ago, six months, nine months, and 12 months ago? I think the, the two charts uh, express really well how we've been, we've been changing our views. Um, first, it's like to, I'd like to highlight the diminishing expectations for the U.S. in the first block of columns in the left-hand side, and then for Japan in the last block of columns, also in the left-hand side. And We've been increasing the forecast for the UK and the Eurozone systematically over the recent year, over the recent months, over the last year. So 
a bit more optimistic with Europe, less optimistic with U.S. and Japan, although in U.S. we remain confident that the fundamentals are there. So growth should peak in 2016 in the U.S. And then, on the other hand, you have the, the emerging markets. They are completely diverging nowadays. So I think the BRIC acronym may not even be suitable anymore. So you have China and India leading the, the EM growth pack, and then you have Brazil and Russia as the worst performers. So not so bright outlook for Brazil and Russia, and now India being the fastest growing emerging markets. And this was mostly related to the revisions to national accounts. So this last bar that shows a big review to India, it's mostly related to data revisions. Then let's put this picture into a longer horizon. Um, for us, we believe that um, world GDP will be below average this year again, um, and then next year should pick up gradually. But most importantly, growth in the emerging markets world will be the weakest since 2001, if we exclude the 2009 recession, which is certainly worrying. So global GDP will be more balanced um, from now on with less participation from emerging markets and, some, and a bigger share from advanced economies. So moderate growth and receding inflation risks in advanced economies. So as you can see, this chart just shows the evolution <coughs> of the forecast for inflation since a year ago. And as you can see, all the main advanced economies will post headline inflation below 0.5% this year. So incredibly low inflation uh, for the advanced economies. And this is mostly related to the fall in oil prices since last year. So we have this combination of weak growth or moderate growth and very low inflation. What does it mean for monetary policy? So according to the chart on the left-hand side, you can see that we don't expect central banks to hike rates aggressively in the advanced world in the next five years. Um, in Europe and Japan, rates will barely rise in the next five years. So leading the pack, we have the U.S. Fed scheduled to rise in September, um, and then you have the Bank of England scheduled to rise by the beginning of next year. So if bond yields... Um, should be a function of short rates plus a term premium. Uh, if you have lower short rates, you also have lower long-term rates. And countries with uh, substantial central bank action, like Eurozone and Japan, bond yields will fall further before they start rising. So overall, the picture for central banks is that central bank policy will remain supportive, but they are diverging um, a little bit. So. Central bank support uh, will continue in Japan, will actually inc increase um, later this year. The Fed will remain pretty much stable, the balance sheet, as you can see on the left-hand side. And the Eurozone, the ECB, will expand its balance sheet quite dramatically this year. So as you can see in the chart on the right-hand side, you see that uh, central bank support will be mainly uh, driven by Japan and Europe. So, supportive uh, central bank uh, ECB policy will mean, <clears throat> so interest rates um, stuck at zero in the Eurozone and Fed, rate high, Fed rates uh, expected to rise later this year mean that the forward-looking uh, UIP, uh, Uncovered Interest Party, suggests more Euro weakening towards the end of the year. So, we, this is shown on the chart on the left-hand side, and we expect Euro-dollar parity in Q3 as the Fed uh, starts to hike rates. An increase in uh, Japanese quantitative easing that we expect to be announced in October for 20 trillions more, uh, totally 100 trillions, should suggest that the, the, U, the yen should depreciate further towards the end of the year. Another interesting factor is that um, as the Bank of Japan starts to buy more bonds, um, the Bank of Japan will actually own almost 40% of total government debt by the end of 2016 in Japan. So we forecast uh, weaker yen to dollar exchange rate, 129.7 by year end and 134.5 by 2016. Moving the focus to China, um, 
China, what's going on at the moment is that the, the fall in property prices and land prices has come in a bad time for local governments. So local governments, more than 40% of their all overall revenues are related to property. So a, a fall in property prices means also a fall in their revenues. And this comes at a time where debt is maturing. So China, Chinese local governments face a very difficult schedule for uh, debt for their debt profile. So you have 28%, almost a third of their debt maturing this year, and they face large repayments, as you can see, um, over 6 trillion yuan in principal repayments and then 1.5 on interest repayments. This also at a time where the People Bank of China is restraining their capacity to issue more debt. And as a result, we believe that local governments will have to cut on capital expenditure and will postpone some projects, and therefore it will be a fall in local government financed um, investment. This should push GDP down to 6.6% from 6.8% we had last month, and this is well below both the, um, the official target of 7% and also below consensus estimates. And lastly, I'll talk about the dollar. We recently published a detailed research. Actually, Adam Slater published it, and he's right next to me. He's going to talk about the relationship on the dollar and emerging markets. Adam, I'll pass it all to you. Hello, everybody. As we all know, the dollar has strengthened significantly uh, over the last year by around 16%. And in our view, this will have significant impacts on a number of emerging markets. We, are, as Marcos mentioned, already have a quite downbeat forecast for uh, emerging market growth this year. And one reason for that is, indeed, the dollar. We look back at the last 30 years or so, and we see that strong dollar episodes do tend to have been associated with weaker growth in emerging markets. They also tend to have been associated with um, clusters of financial distress episodes, including defaults. And you can see that on the right-hand side of the slide here. This process of dollar strength to emerging weakness goes through several channels. These include weaker commodity prices, uh, impact on capital flows and domestic monetary conditions and emerges, and also balance sheet effects. Uh, rising burdens of dollar debt as local currencies depreciate, rising debt service burdens also in some cases. And a final channel which we think is perhaps becoming increasingly important is that it risks generating a broader deleveraging cycle in emerging markets where debt levels overall, not just external debt, have risen quite a lot over recent years. If we look at the development of external debt over the last few years, we find that for a sample of large emergers, the external debt to GDP ratio is starting to creep back up towards its peak levels of the late 1990s. And if that is especially the case if we exclude China from the analysis. And we find that a number of large debt builds have taken place, including in countries such as Malaysia, Hungary, and South Africa. And this was very much encouraged by the low interest rates, which we saw in the wake of the global financial crisis, which encouraged the accumulation of this debt. Some emerging countries are nevertheless much more vulnerable than others. Um, what we find in general, if we look at by country at debt to GDP ratios, is that the average levels for most emergers now are below the past peak levels that there have been. Um, but that is not true in all cases. There are countries such as Hungary, Malaysia, Romania, um, South Africa, Taiwan, even Turkey, and to some extent where that is no longer the case, where we have external debt to GDP ratios hitting new highs. Um, what I think is possibly a, a promising element, however, is that for a lot of the Asian countries, external debt to GDP ratios are, are well below the peak levels we saw in, in the Asian crisis at the end of the 1990s. Currency composition also varies a lot, um, the currency composition of external debt. Um, we find some 
emerging countries in Latin America, for example, also Russia, where dollar debt overwhelmingly dominates their total external debt. Um, then we have other countries, for example, in Eastern Europe, where euro-denominated debt is more important. And of course, this matters because whilst the dollar is strengthened um, against the local currencies of these countries, that's not always the case for the euro. Uh, in some cases, these emerging countries' currencies have actually gained against the euro. So if you have then euro-denominated debt, you, you don't suffer the kind of balance sheet effects that we're concerned about. And also worth noting that quite a few emerging markets now issue external debt effectively in local currencies. So their external debt is, um, for example, government bonds issued but owned by, by foreigners. And that is true in countries like Malaysia, South Africa, Mexico. So this is a, another potential cushion against the impact of the stronger dollar. So it's quite a mixed picture across the emerging markets in terms of vulnerability. This is also true of commodity dependence. Um, which is a, a very, very key um, factor, I think, in, in vulnerability. Stronger dollar tends to push down global commodity prices. And whilst we have countries like Russia, other oil exporters, Malaysia, Chile, all very geared to the commodity cycle, we also have countries like China and India, which are net importers of commodities and will benefit from lower prices. And that's also true of the, uh, the Asian industrialized countries, such as Korea and Taiwan. Now, I think a particular sort of non-linear risk that there is with the stronger dollar reflects what might happen to capital inflows to emerging markets. One thing that strong dollar episodes have been associated with in the past is sudden stops in capital inflows to some countries, or even more broadly than that, to emerging markets as a whole. And we do see that over the last few months, um, portfolio flows in particular into emerging markets have dropped off quite sharply in a similar way to the way they did in the so-called taper tantrum of 2013. So perhaps some room for concern there, although having said that, so far at least, with one or two exceptions, we don't see these, this drop-off in capital inflows causing widespread financial distress, um, forcing up local interest rates and so on. Um, in fact, in quite a lot of the emergers, rates have actually been cut recently, so um, probably not quite time to ring the alarm bells yet, but there is a potential risk here should the situation continue or, or become even more serious. And in terms of deleveraging, um, well, we, if you look at the chart on the left-hand side here, what is really striking, I think, is the overall credit to the private sector as a percentage of GDP in emerging Asia, which has now exceeded that in the G7. Now, to a large extent, that's driven by China, which has a very high private debt-to-GDP ratio now. But even if we take China out of the equation, you can see that more generally in emerging markets, there has been a, a significant buildup of private sector debt. Other Asian countries are feature strongly in terms of the countries that have put on the most debt. We point to Korea, Taiwan, Thailand, Malaysia, all being countries that have put on a lot of, of um, private sector debt over the last several years. But also outside Asia, you could point to countries like Turkey and Brazil, where there have been big rises in debt ratios. And this brings me back to the point I made earlier on about the risk of a deleveraging cycle. What you might get is that the external debt portion of overall debt, if you like, being pushed up effectively, um, the burden of it by a rising dollar, that might create a, a threshold effect for overall debt uh, and lead to deleveraging as a result of that. If we bring it all together, which we can do in the final couple of slides here, we've built a big risk matrix here for about 20 leading emerging markets. When we look at all these different elements that we've discussed, including commodity exports, overall private debt to GDP, external debt, and also a couple of other interesting uh, indicators, short-term debt to reserves, a very popular liquidity indicator, um, inflation, which, if you like, is, is a measure of how much pressure there might be to force up domestic interest rates in the, in the face of, um, for example, weaker currencies and drop-off in capital inflows. And finally, what we call our debt-weighted exchange rate, which is up on the right-hand column, which is a, a calculation which takes into account the share of different currencies in external debt. If we put all these di different uh, indicators together, we can give them a score for each country where the red 
chunks here represent the, the most vulnerable countries and the, the green chunks the least vulnerable with, with two intermediate groups in between. And the big splurges of red can be seen on countries like, perhaps predictably, Venezuela, Turkey, Russia, um, perhaps less predictably, Malaysia. Um, and uh, then you have, I think, um, a secondary group of, of countries which have bad scores on several indicators that are not quite in the same league as, as the, the, the very vulnerable countries. And those would include places like Argentina, Brazil, um, Chile, um, Colombia, Hungary to some extent as well. And the final slide that we have on this groups these countries into, into uh, four groups where we call them high risk, moderate risk, limited risk, and low risk. Um, I think these should be taken as a, as a reference rather than a very decisive division. Um, essentially, we have two ends of the spectrum here. And um, we've looked at a limited range of in indicators, so there, there's always some scope for countries to migrate a little bit from one group to another, although not too dramatically, I think. And as mentioned, the countries where we'd be most concerned are the countries where you've got some combination of high debt, high external debt, um, high commodity reliance. Um, that particular cocktail is, um, and, and, a, and a high dollar share within external debt. That particular cocktail is, is the particularly dangerous one at the moment. And um, as mentioned, those include places like Malaysia, Turkey, Russia, Venezuela. Um, whereas at the other end of the spectrum, we'd be less worried about places like Korea and Taiwan and India. China is an interesting one um, because although in volume terms it has quite a lot of dollar debt, um, as a proportion of the, of the overall economy, it, it isn't that large, which is one of the reasons it ends up in this, in this green low risk group. But I'll just say one thing about China and perhaps about some of the other countries as well, which is worth bearing in mind, is that all this is based on the data that we have, um, and there are uncertainties uh, about just how much external debt is out there for some of these countries, especially with the, uh, the growing phenomenon of offshore debt issuance by, by um, affiliates of companies within emerging markets. So there's always a, a degree of um, margin of error in these kind of estimates. Very good. Um, thank you very much, Adam. Um, we're going to open now for questions from the audience. And before we get our first question, myself as a Brazilian, I have a curiosity here to ask Adam. Um, I noticed that, I'll just go back to the last slide here, and I noticed that Brazil shows up as a moderate risk country. But over recent weeks, not the last two weeks, but uh, over since mid-January, Brazil has suffered, has been hit quite heavily by the, the latest wave of dollar strengthening. And the Brazilian real was probably the worst performing country and uh, worst performing currency in the emerging market space. Why did you classify Brazil as a moderate risk, Adam? Okay, well, first of all, the, when we're classifying risk here, we're classifying it as a risk to GDP growth rather than a risk to the exchange rate. Right. Um, so that's the first thing that's worth mentioning. Um, Brazil's exchange rate has weakened quite a lot. Uh, that's correct. And that is a, a risk factor within, within the matrix as it stands. Why Brazil doesn't end up quite, I think it's very close actually, doesn't quite end up in the very bad group is because the total burden of external debt in Brazil is not that high, about 23% of GDP, um, and the short-term external debt to reserves ratio is not all that high either, about 13%. But I think it's probably worth mentioning on that latter point that um, how you calculate that short-term external debt to reserves ratio does matter here, and there are it sounds like a technical point, but there are two different ways of calculating it, by original maturity of debt or by residual maturity. Um, now, for most countries, we only have the first um, one of those. We only have original maturity data, and that's what we use in the table. For Brazil, in fact, we also have residual maturity debt, and that's not as good. That, that sh on that basis, the short-term debt to external, uh, short external debt to reserves ratio is, is somewhat higher than 13%. It's more like 30 um, having said that, it wouldn't affect the rankings that much. I did test it out when I designed the, the matrix, and it doesn't quite, still doesn't quite sneak into the top group. But it's the next one down. So, um, as I said, 
we shouldn't be too rigid about uh, who, who we uh, write off and who we don't as a result of the, the rankings. Um, countries in the moderate risk group, uh, there are also issues there too. Right. So the build-up in reserves that Brazil did over the last 10 years certainly helped. Mm. And that's also true for quite a lot of the other countries as well. In fact, you will find that, um, I mean, the Asian countries are the classic example. The short-term debt to reserves measure became popular at that time because it proved to be a very good predictor of the distress that followed in a lot of the countries in 1997 and 1998. The Asian countries responded to that um, in the decade or so afterwards by building up a lot of reserves. What's interesting, if you look down that column now, is that um, they're all fairly moderate. Uh, but there is one very notable exception, which is Malaysia, mm. where the uh, short-term debt-to-reserve ratio has crept back above 100%, um, and that's one of the key reasons why we have Malaysia in that top group of, of risky countries. And Turkey as well, right? Yeah. So Tur probably there's a lot of euro-denominated debt. In the Turkey has a mixture of dollar and euro-denominated debt, which, um, which is a slight shield, um, but it's pretty bad on most of the indicators. And the overall debt buildup in Turkey has, has been um, a little uncomfortably high, I think, over the last few years. So it's certainly one of the countries we've got our eyes on, yeah. So just taking the link from the late 1990s, um, there was a, a quote about the original sin, that is the accumulation of external debt by emerging markets. Um, and since the late 1990s, uh, most governments managed to avoid the original sin by issuing mostly local currency denominated debt. Uh, but apparently corporations ignored this risk and took a lot of uh, dollar-denominated or foreign currency-denominated debt. How this build up in private external debt threatened the outlook for emerging markets? Yeah. Actually, another risk that became evident back at the time of the Asian crisis was precisely that, which is that even if the sovereign's external debt wasn't very high, there was a risk that the private sector's external debt would be um, and that that could also cause financial, serious financial distress. And that's exactly what we saw in places like Korea at, at the time. Um, so turning to today, um, well, yes, we have seen a big buildup of uh, external debt issuance by corporations. Part of this is a natural process. You know, these are emerging markets and these are countries where the companies have grown and they're stepping into the world stage in a way perhaps they didn't before. Um, and therefore, some of it's a, a natural process. Um, but some of it also reflects the same factors we mentioned at the start, which is the temptation of issuing in low-yielding hard currencies. Um, and if you're not properly protected against the price swings that might then happen, you can obviously end up with financial distress through bankruptcies, defaults, and so on. Or short of that, just you know, great severe worsening of corporate finances and cuts to investment employment and so on. Um, basically, you could divide your, your companies into, into three groups. You can have um, companies which operate mostly in dollars, have large dollar assets, for example, or revenue substantially in dollars. If they borrow in dollars as well, it may not be the end of the world. They may, they may be reasonably well hedged against uh, the kind of exchange rate moves. The mining companies. And the mining companies, the resource companies, all sorts, yeah. Um, you have companies like that. The, the other end of the spectrum, you have companies with no significant foreign exchange assets, um, no real dollar reserves, but who are borrowing in dollars because it, it works for them one, for some other reason. They potentially are, are very vulnerable then to exchange rate moves, and um, there are probably quite a lot of those out there too. Unfortunately, the data doesn't allow us to distinguish very clearly between these groups of countries. Uh, companies within, within countries, but um, uh, one obvious story which has been doing the rounds for some weeks is that Chinese property companies, for example, are believed to have quite substantial uh, dollar debts, whereas they don't really have very much in the way of dollar assets, and uh, those are the kind of areas where you don't want financial distress to, to grow in any case, um, because there are all kinds of reasons why that, that's a problem already with, without this extra exchange rate effect being laid on. Well, at least the yuan is strengthening as a dollar. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> we uh, don't know for how long. We don't know for how long, but yes, for the, for the time being, it has done very slightly. Um, but the pressure is is somewhat the other way overall. So um, this is this is one of the issues that will come up. I think um, taking it a step further, if dollar strengthening continues, which which it 
it may well do, and certainly some modest additional strengthening is in our forecast. It is quite possible that the first casualties that we will see uh, will be companies um, and not sovereigns this time around. Um, where exactly those will crop up, we can't be sure, given the, the paucity of the information that, that we have. But um, I think at the country level, at least, we can have some idea based, based on the matrix of information that we've presented. That surely helps. Right. So there was another question that came up here. Um, it seems like the quantitative easing on the scale of Europe and especially Japan distorts price signals in credit markets. Are there any risks that result from this, Adam? Uh, it's a very um, wide-ranging question. Um, I mean, I think uh, essentially this is correct in the sense that, um, as we mentioned, the QE programs that we saw after the global financial crisis pushed down interest rates to very, very low levels and held them there. And that has probably encouraged um, an inappropriate level of uh, foreign currency borrowing in, in some emerging markets, at least. Um, and yes, there are there are risks that result from this. The, the risks are very much the ones that we've outlined, that when the, the whole process goes into reverse, as it's starting to do in the United States, um, some companies and potentially some sovereigns also are left in a very difficult position. Um, I think it's almost certainly true that uh, QE contributed to, the, to the, um, the, the final leg of the upswing in commodity prices as well, um, which was a big boost for, for emerging markets uh, as a whole, and specifically the, the commodity exporters, and probably meant, um, again, that there was an encouragement to, to then borrow on the back of that. And once again, if the process goes into reverse, you're, you're left in, in a difficult position. I mean, this also is something worth mentioning with regard to the um, different kinds of companies we were talking about earlier on. Even if you have your revenues in dollars, let's say you're a mining company or petroleum producer, or, uh, for example, with uh, the fall in commodity prices, your, the amount of dollars you're getting in is down. So your debt servicing capacity is falling anyway, even if you are in theory currency hedged, you're not price hedged completely. So these kind of com companies can get into distress too in this situation. We might talk about Petrobras for example. Yeah. The Chinese are the only one lending to Petrobras at the moment, which is <laughs> obviously not a good sign. Indeed. So, I mean, in a sense, we already have the kind of um, signals of, of, of corporate distress which we, we were talking about emerging here and there. And I, I would expect to see more of these kind of stories developing uh, over the rest of this year. Sure. Okay, I think there's another question coming up from Adrian. Oh. Okay, so there are no other questions. So with that, we're going to close here. Um, thank you very much for attending our webinar, and have a nice evening or afternoon, depending on where you are in the world. Thank you. Thanks. Bye-bye.